welcome to an introduction to the world's religions. Today we begin our unit on Judaism. Critical reasoning can be fruitful and frustrating. By its very design, critical theory challenges us to rethink the categories we use to make sense of the human experience. So while we may arrive at a better sense of what we know, it's likely as a result of realizing we know a lot less than we thought. Even an introductory study of Judaism shows how this plays out. A while ago, I came across this modern artifact of sorts. It's an advertisement for a Jewish college group called Hillel. Hillel was a Jewish sage who taught in Jerusalem around the start of the Common Era. His teachings formed the basis of scholarly scriptural interpretation and ethics. Anyway, the Campus Life organization is devoted to enrich the lives of Jewish undergraduate and graduate students so that they may enrich the Jewish people and the world. So ancient Jewish scholar, contemporary Jewish students, you can see the rationale for the name. The brochure was taken from a university student life office, and when you look closely, it says some profound things about what it means to be Jewish. This particular chapter aims to maximize the number of Jewish students doing Jewish with other Jews. Included in their list of Jewish activities are challah baking, Shabbat services and dining, Israeli dancing, and Dodgers games. Which one of these is not like the other, right? But as the brochure says, people ascribe Jewishness as a cultural, ethnic, and religious signifier. This very point challenges us to ask whether there is a common factor between all these different ways of being Jewish. If not, there would be little reason to talk about Judaism in any critically helpful way. One way scholars approach Judaism is by thinking about it broadly as the story of a people striving to become worthy of a divine relationship. This idea has roots in the ancient myth of Jacob. The son of Isaac, son of Abraham, Jacob had a history of grasping for a blessed life. In utero, Jacob tried to grab at his twin's heel in a last-ditch effort to arrive as the firstborn son. Jacob in Hebrew means leg puller. Later in life, Jacob successfully impersonated his brother at his father's deathbed in order to usurp a blessing. And when Jacob crossed paths with a spiritual being, he literally wrestled away a blessing from God. Thus, Jacob earned the additional name of Israel, which means he who struggles with God. Now, struggle with is an ambiguous phrase. On the one hand, it gives the impression that one is fighting with God. And for certain, the tribe of Judah and others of Ju Jacob's descendants had a contentious relationship with God. But they also were God's allies who struggled against their divine mortal foes. The ups and downs of this relationship make for a great allegory for working out the human condition. Jewish history spans many miles and millennia. But the idea of a group striving to become the kind of people worthy of a divine relationship ties it all together. But what is fascinating about this is that the significance of each thread changes in relationship to the place and time the Jews inhabit. Take our basic idea about Judaism, people striving to become worthy of a divine relationship. As shorthand for this, I'd like to introduce some Hebrew terms. Israel, the one struggling with God. Berith, covenant promise, and Bethel, the house of God. Jews ascribe different ideas to these terms depending on when and where they are. In the first millennium BCE, Jacob's line flourishes into the kingdom of Israel, a people whose rulers were entrusted with the law, Torah, to keep them righteous, and a temple so that they may cohabitate with the presence of God. But when they fail to live up to this covenant, God sends prophets to warn the Jews to shape up. And when this warning goes unheeded, God uses other Near Eastern empires to spell disaster for the Jews. Syria, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, and eventually Rome. God uses all these people to teach Israel a lesson. Obey my commandments, live up to our covenant, and follow my law so you may relate well to God. In the first millennium CE, the Jewish people are now spread out among the Roman Empire, and they work diligently to think about where they've gone wrong in living out the covenant, for instead of the house of God, they've ended up in the house of Caesar. So in this time, we see an intense amount of interest in learning how to better follow the law. 
Sages called rabbis emerged to devote their lives to understanding how to interpret the Torah and gather followers with whom they can share their knowledge. This gathering or syncing up with each other is where we get the term synagogue, the place where Jews work to live up to a covenant so they may better relate to God. As we move into the second millennium CE, we're talking about the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and modernity. And there we can witness many of the same trends that we've associated with Western civilization. How can a fallen people experience a rebirth, a renaissance into the people they were born to be? Does not a covenant with God require a better understanding or enlightenment about who we are as human beings? Should modern people struggle for life, liberty, property, and happiness through the auspices of the church or the state? And what does that mean when your people are at home in neither? And if human wickedness leaves so few of your people alive, then mustn't God be dead or non-existent? If we can abstract an essential quality to Judaism, perhaps it is that those who belong to it make a commitment to ask these and other questions in terms of Israel, Berith, and Bethel. Hillel, the student group that I introduced in the beginning, thus represents a postmodern facet of Judaism, a space for otherwise competing views of Judaism to relish in what they have in common. As we begin to explore Judaism, reflect on the following questions. What do you think is at the core of Jewishness? Think about where you have heard about Jews in your history classes. How do you see Jewishness expressed in those moments? What other social constructions, like gender, ethnicity, or religion, are similarly difficult to define? 